Arnaud, the world's richest man. The biggest influence on fashion today. Bernard Arnaud, fashion mogul. He is one of the most important businessmen in the world, certainly the most important in France right now. Hardly is there any celebrity worth his or her salt today who does not own a brand of Louis Vuitton as a bag or shoes or other necessary accessories in his or her wardrobe. The same thing goes for the high-end liquor, Moet and Hennessy, which are party and club specials for anyone who knows their drinks. Has it ever crossed your mind how the owners of these successful companies must feel having the creme de la creme of society buy their products with great fortune and use them with a great sense of pride? They must be riding in high heavens of fulfillment. More than that, how would you feel if I told you that these great companies are owned by just one person? A shock, right? I know too. Louis Vuitton and Moet Hennessy were merged to form LVMH, which is owned and for the most part controlled by the phenomenal Bernard Arnault, the septuagenarian of French origin who does not act anything like his age as he continues to make giant strides in the luxury fashion industry. Recently, according to Forbes and other millionaire ranking companies, he unseated some world richest business moguls. This is no small feat, and that is why we are going to look into the life of Bernard Arnault today. Like most curious minds, we want to know some things that have become quite fascinating about him. Has he always loved fashion? Was he born into old wealth and had everything handed to him on a platter? Or did he have to wade through the ocean of competition and uncertainty to get to his current position? Would you believe it if you were told that Bernard Arnault was not born by luxury fashionistas and did not exactly have anyone to look up to when he was growing up? At least, not in the regard of parents who continuously acquired luxury companies. Chapter 1. The Unusual Beginning On the 5th of March, 1949, Bernard Arnault was born in Roubaix, France. Like in most families, his parents, Marie-Joseph Savinel and Jean-Léon Arnault, cherished the arrival of their son and did everything to make sure he grew up healthily. Bernard was especially loved by his father, and it showed in the school he attended. Bernard's father was a graduate of the École Centrale Paris, where he studied engineering and went ahead to own his civil engineering company. A few years down the line, when Bernard was ripe for the tertiary institution, he was enrolled in École Polytechnique Paris, the most selective engineering school in France at the time, where he graduated with a degree in engineering. Upon graduation from the Polytechnic, he started working with his father immediately at his father's civil engineering company, where he rose to the ladder of position and served in many departments of the company before he took the helm of the company in 1970. While he was a director, he talked his father into converting their business into real estate. Being an adventurous and highly enterprising person, he must have seen the future of real estate and the possible returns it could bring them. His father yielded and they did real estate for a while before he lost interest again. And this time, textiles and retails were the center of his attention. Like most successful business barons, they always dabble into multiple adventures before settling with one or a few that bring them the utmost satisfaction. Such was the case with Bernard Arnault. Except that even when he found his calling, which was luxury fashion, he didn't stop acquiring every business that seemed to be sinking. To him, he was redeeming them. And why not? He had the money. You will agree with me at this point that Bernard is indeed a rare breed, because with a robust background in engineering, one would expect him to have stuck to construction. But who knows? Maybe he couldn't find satisfaction with that line of profession. Or maybe he was simply a man with big dreams. So how does a man with no family in the fashion business line become a force to reckon with in the trends and vogue world today? It's a journey full of hills and valleys, and ultimately, valuable life lessons. Chapter 2. The Iconic Transition Bernard Arnault did not begin his journey into the fashion world until 1985, following some life events that prodded him in that direction. At some point, Arnault, due to the Tax the Rich policy that was started in 1981, had to move his family to the US. The policy at the time was aimed at the redistribution of wealth, supporting equitable growth, the standard of living improvement, etc. But being the shrewd businessman that Arnaud was, he moved his family to a place where he could get to keep all his money. While in the US for three years, he kept growing his family business of real estate development and retail business. As he continued to steer the competitive market, his eyes began to open to other lines of business, 
which he would otherwise not have been privy to in France. In addition to making steady progress even in a foreign country, he was prepared to foray into other businesses once he returned home to his country. At this point, it would be inappropriate to continue without commending the great French man, one who was referred to as a visionary leader by his fans and admirers, while his detractors called him the Wolf in Kashmir. The reason for this is that he could have decided to stay back in the US and build his dreams there, but he wanted to go down in history as one of the people who developed their homelands with their talents and business acuity. In 1984, after three years of business sojourn, he returned to France, and that was when he started to become the man the world knows today. It turned out that in the three years he was away, he had been eyeing luxury fashion houses, even when he was engrossed in real estate and other retail businesses that he dabbled into earlier in his life. From afar, he had been looking to get into the enterprise of haute couture, but he seemed far-fetched for a while. However, his chance came when the French conglomerate called Boussac was going down at the tail end of 1984. At the time, Boussac, a popular empire, was fast sinking, and the government, in a bid to salvage it, was giving a huge price slash to anyone willing to buy it. It was a lifetime opportunity, one that Bernard knew doesn't come by often. Boussac was an empire that was known for textile, retail, and other quacking businesses, but the subject matter of the lot was the House of Dior, another of Boussac's sub-enterprises which had captured the interest of Marie-Joseph Savinel, Arnaud's mother, for a long time. It is not exactly clear if Arnaud took interest in Dior because of his mother's fantasy, or maybe he developed his own interests without his mother's interference. Anyway, he grabbed the opportunity with his two hands. He took a huge sum of money, which was worth $15 million at the time, from his family business, and an additional $65 million in financing from an investment firm. With that, he was able to buy Boussac. Then he sold off all the assets, leaving only the House of Dior, which is popularly recognized as Dior today. That company would turn out to be the foundation, or building blocks, of his subsequent business, as he reinvested the money in the other luxury companies, Louis Vuitton, Moet, and Hennessy, the merger that birthed the widely known LVMH. Over time, about three decades later, he has acquired over 70 other companies, making it a conglomerate where he owns over 50% of the top luxury brands in the world, some of which are Moet de Chandon, Christian Dior, Louis Vuitton, Hennessy, Dom Perignon, Sephora, and Tag Hoya. Notable among his exploits was the taking over of Louis Vuitton with the liquor company Moet and Hennessy. The company became a tremendous success, one that could not be ignored in the whole of France and the whole world. As of today, LVMH is worth a whopping sum of $360 billion. And even more jaw-dropping is the fact that the company recorded a sale of nothing less than $60 billion within the first nine months of last year, 2022. The success of LVMH is no magic. It took the red-hot passion and unwavering astuteness of Arnaud to build LVMH to where it is today. The success that cannot but be associated with the planting of the company in every location that seems favorable for business. Arnaud is a workaholic who on some days visits up to 25 locations to see the progress and ensure that the business is running according to plan. After the revolutionary and rather messy beginning of LVMH, Arnaud made sure to invigorate the luxury world by producing the top-notch quality of the many brands of luxury products he brought under the LVMH umbrella. His motor was that if they would be selling a high-end product, they might as well give their all in the creation of those products. Chapter 3. Power Strive For some time now, Bernard Arnault has been effortlessly tipping other billionaires from the ladder top. At the time when it seemed Elon Musk's fortune had dipped due to the business investment he underwent, the Tesla and SpaceX CEO had taken over Twitter in October 2022, and a large chunk of his wealth had been used to finance it. In all of this, Bernard had managed to hold his fort. His wealth appeared to have grown incredibly, even when other businesses had reasons to fold or record great losses. LVMH's success has been tied to the company's stock, which has risen steadily since 2020. Currently, the company's stock price has increased nearly by 65%. LVMH certainly deserves its flowers, as only a few companies can compete at this level and hold their heads above water, especially as many businesses are still trying to find their feet 
after the recession hit that the world suffered during the pandemic. For Bernard Arnault, the panic seemed like water off the duck's back, as demand for luxury items seemed to increase. Also, according to Forbes, Bernard's fortune has increased in multiple folds to many billions. Estimatedly, his fortune rose from $76 billion to $150 billion around that time. But that was only recent. Far back in the 80s and early 90s, he was known to be a real pain in the neck of the government and his competitors. He was known to always make cutthroat decisions, as long as they helped him scale his business. At some point, he fired 9,000 employees by selling off some companies because he wanted to focus on his two major businesses at the time. One power move he made that earned him the respect of his country and the business world was in 1987. After divesting the assets of Busak except for Dior, he was looking for ways to invest the proceeds. And just at that time, Henry Racamier, the CEO of Louis Vuitton, had invited him to invest in his company. Being an astute businessman, he invested a lot of money to the tune of 500 million. Worthy of note at this point is the fact that Louis Vuitton and Moet Hennessy had merged into LVMH, and Henry Racamier had requested Arnaud's investment to further strengthen his position against the CEO of Moet Hennessy, Alain Chevalier, whose stake was much higher. However, since the merger, it seemed the two CEOs couldn't agree on anything. Just like water and oil, they couldn't mix. The issue degenerated so much that they started filing lawsuits against each other. That was the moment Arnaud was waiting for, and he was going to take it. It wasn't long before it dawned on Henry that his comrade had his own sinister ambition, when all the while he thought the only enemy he had was Alain. After the revelation, he wasted no time in calling on other liquor businessmen, like Lézard Ferré, who at the time was at the helm of affairs at Guinness in the UK. He, alongside Moet Chandon and the Hennessy family, helped him secure 45% in the LVMH. Ultimately, the court ruled in the favor of Arnaud. Shortly after, he was able to get rid of Racamier. He didn't stop at that. He went ahead to expunge all the senior executives at the LVMH company while replacing them with his own people. It seemed it was a necessary loose end that needed to be tied. Arnaud, after what was considered to be one of the toughest power tussles in France, became the chair and CEO with the largest share in the company a position he gracefully occupied until today. With LVMH in his pocket, he became unstoppable, and he combined Dior with LVMH and other companies, which then resulted in a big, powerful conglomerate in the world. Another thing that sets Arnaud aside is his ability to recognize and manage talents. In the course of establishing a record with the LVMH brand in France and beyond Europe, he often hired popular designers to make custom designs for his luxury brand. This he did to introduce versatility and also give the designers an edge. Over the years, Arnaud has worked with Guerlain, Céline, Thomas Pink, Kenzo, Givenchy, Lowe, DKNY, and Fendi. At the top of Arnaud's reign in LVMH, Louis Vuitton, by 2011, had taken the spot for the world's most luxurious and expensive brand for six successive years with a brand estimation of slightly above $23 billion. LVMH didn't need a special PR, as it was evident for all to see that they are the master of the game, because their brand valuation was the total brand estimate of Hermes, Gucci, and Chanel. Chapter 4. Standing on the Shoulders of Giants Bernard Arnault has not claimed to be an island who knows it all. He has attributed his success to constantly drawing inspiration from some significant businessmen in the world, some of which are Warren Buffett, the greatest investor of all time, and Steve Jobs, the co-founder and one-time CEO of Apple Inc. Bernard once revealed that Warren Buffett was the businessman he respected most because of his brilliant business ideas and his ability to stick to his principles. According to him, Warren Buffett has never let go of his buy-and-hold investment belief while patiently waiting and monitoring the market as closely as possible. From the business journey of Bernard Arnault, it is clear why he appreciates the incredible investor. He also, before he built LVMH, had displayed a great deal of patience by waiting to seize the right opportunity in the form of Christian Dior. Somebody else could have invested in any other crumbling fashion house apart from Dior in a desperate attempt to break into the fashion world. The company could have turned out to be irredeemable 
As time went by, his patience made him deliberately court some other companies before he acquired them. For example, he intentionally waited and befriended Bulgari, an Italian jewelry company, for almost a decade before going for the kill in 2011. A lot of people might consider that move on Bulgari as ruthless, but that is the world we live in, a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Most businesses won't make it big if they refuse to seize unusual opportunities. It may look to the layman like taking advantage of helpless people, but one important attribute of successful businessmen is recognizing opportunities when others see nothing. However, while it may seem like Arnaud has taken Warren as a role model or mentor of some sort, he has not completely followed in his footsteps. For instance, Warren has pledged to donate half of his fortune to charity, and so far he has bestowed more than $45 billion since 2006. Arnaud, on the other hand, has not made such a declaration, at least not to the knowledge of the public yet. Although Arnaud has not made a public proclamation about his active philanthropy, like Warren Buffett, he showed a great sense of generosity toward the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris when it suffered a fire outbreak in 2019. Toward its restoration, Arnaud donated a sum of $226 million, and he didn't exactly make a public comment about it, still on the matter of standing on the shoulders of giants. Apart from Warren Buffett, another person that catches the admiration of Arnaud is Steve Jobs, the co-founder of Apple. He particularly liked Steve because of his creativity. And also, both men shared each other's admiration, as Arnaud in 2017 revealed to Forbes that Steve had, at one time, approached him to seek clarity when Apple wanted to open retail stores. Steve was able to make an undeniable impact at Apple because of his hunger for growth. His ability to turn creativity into reality by making somewhat mysterious ideas acceptable to people in the real world is also to die for. Some of these peculiarities have been adopted by Arnaud. Notable finance news houses, including the Financial Times, described Arnaud in 2019 as a famously competitive luxury brand owner who has a compulsion for nothing less than success. Other media houses also commend him on being a shrewd businessman who holds on to something he believes in and never lets go. The story of Bernard Arnault is an inspiring one in many ways. You cannot and should not allow your background to stop you from pursuing your dreams. A career shift or change is possible at any point in time. All you need to do is believe in its possibility. If you want to learn about other successful business magnates, then don't hesitate to press the like and subscribe button.